There have always been ghosts in the machine. How do we explain this behavior? Random segments of code? Or is it something more? We are on the eve of the largest robotic distribution in history. There will be one robot to every five humans. How many robots have ever committed a crime? Yeah, I know. The three laws, you know. Perfect circle of protection. A robot cannot harm a human being. The first law of robotics. Laws are made to be broken. It's slightly in the future, and USR, who has revolutionized technology with the, the first line of personal robots. So all of your technology goes through your robot. And there's a, a perfect circle of protection for humanity from robots. They're the three laws of robotics that govern all robots. First law, a robot can not harm a human being or by inaction allow a human being to come to harm. The second law of robotics is a robot must obey any order given by a human being unless it conflicts with the first law of robotics. And the third law is that a robot can defend itself unless it conflicts with the first or second laws of robotics. So there's a perfect logic circle when I was a kid, iRobot was one of the select science fiction books that I always thought would be, would be really cool to make a movie of. It's been a tough one to translate to the screen because it is a series of short stories, as everyone knows, and uh, trying to find the one concise narrative that would try and tell the story in a bit of a nutshell. This is an adaptation of Asimov's work dealing with the three laws of robotics. It's a warning about the future. It's a warning about technology. I told you so, just doesn't quite say it. We come into the world through the eyes of Will's character. Homicide, Spooner. My character hates technology and uh, hates robots. He used to be a, a really outgoing, fun guy, but he, he experienced a tragedy and has become somewhat paranoid. Baby, you can be looking in the shadows all the time. The rollout of USR's new generation of robot, the NS5, was marred by the death of designer Alfred Lanning. It looks like a, a suicide, but it feels like a homicide. Detective, the room was security locked. No one came or went. You saw that yourself. Doesn't that mean this has to be suicide? Yeah. Unless the killer's still in here. The whole plot revolves around a robot that is accused of a murder. Susan Calvin, as played by Richard Moynihan, is a character who is obviously very you know, comfortable with the idea of robots because she's helping create them, make them, and perfect them. Probably the polar opposite of Spooner. Very rational and focused. So it's been funny, the relationship that they have. What exactly do you do around here? I specialize in hardware to wetware interfaces in an effort to advance USR's robotic anthropomorphization program. So what exactly do you do around here? I make the robots seem more human. And wasn't that easier to say? Not really. No. Will's character and Richard's character are sort of swept into this kind of intrigue of trying to understand whether the robot really did commit this murder or not. My robots don't kill people. That thing threw somebody out of a window. Is that registering with you? I play Lawrence Robertson, who is the head of USR. And he has developed these robots from the beginning with Dr. Lanning. And I'm convinced that this one prototypical NS5 robot that was built by Alfred Lanning has a bug. 
Murder's a new trick for a robot. Respond. I did not murder him! And uh, what happens in the story as I'm investigating the murders, all of a sudden, uh, lots of U.S. robotics technology starts to malfunction around me. Oh, hell no. Dr. Calvin and my character begin to dive farther into it, and we discover a deep, dark secret. There's a bigger problem with the robots. Alex was a natural. The Crow made him, I think, a cinematic hero to a lot of us. Dark City was a brilliant work. You need a visionary. And this, I think, for him, is the perfect marriage of just a, a story that is you know, compelling, and yet is set within this world that he is very much suited to bring to life. He is uh, one of the most visually arresting directors that we have working today. I sort of described it early on as a documentary of the future because I really wanted to steer away from th Hollywood sort of theatrical kind of approaches to the future. I felt it was important to try and create a, a, a strong sense of reality in this film so that you could actually really believe that you're in this world populated by robots in 35 years' time. So I think people will find the world strangely familiar. Action! You kind of get the chance to be an urban planner for the future. What would we do? How would we do it differently? The world is just into the future. The clothes have just slightly changed a little. There'll be uh, a 100-year-old building right next to a one-year-old building. The cars are cool in the future. They're hot. Every vehicle that you see has to be manufactured as a future element. It's been months and months and months of designing vehicles and building vehicles that appeal to a whole new way of doing things in the future. We have some cool cars with spherical wheels and they can go in any direction, which is a fun idea, but I didn't want to have flying cars. You know, I wanted it to feel very believable, like it was a real progression from our world. And the robots themselves are such intriguing forms of technology that, that I didn't want to have other forms of technology getting in the way of that. The bar keeps getting raised. We can go beyond what we can do with human form and service our imagination. And as that bar keeps getting raised higher and higher and higher, it's up to us to create fantasy that's more and more spectacular. The way we envision the show to be able to shoot it is we had a sort of a mantra, with, without, clean reference. And with means with a proxy playing a robot. So the director can give direction to a being to say, move over here, stand here. This is your action. You're blocked like this. Frame it with a lens. Say, that's the way I'd like the scene to play out. And it, it takes it out of the synthetic world. Sonny. Sonny is played by Alan Tudyk. It's a really interesting and, and sort of difficult role because he is built differently from the other robots. Alan is the soul of Sonny. I'm glad to see you again, Dr. Calvin. We're animating Sonny and we're comparing this, the tiniest nuance that Alan makes on screen. We're analyzing him to the frame and trying to have Sonny copy exactly what Alan has created. It is the same technology that they did Gollum in uh, Two Towers. And I've seen an early version of it where we did a test of a scene and on the screen was my face on one side and then the robot's face was split down the middle. This is why you created us. It's probably a very tough job for an actor because in the end of the day, you'll never see his face, but you will see the embodiment of his work. I'm fortunate to actually have an actor that I'm working with, even though he's wearing a green suit and looks very silly. <laughs> You get the Jolly Green Giant, Kermit the Frog. Hey, it's not easy being green, is it? One of my favorites is a speed skater for the Irish Olympic team. Also, that applies for luge and bobsledding. I'll be happy not to wear this. I'll be happy not to wear this. I mean, it's, my hair's kind of, it's red, so it's sort of an orange-green thing going on, and it's just not, it's not flattering.
we had to find a way that all the robots walked the same way, moved in the same way and so we have paul mercurio as our robot choreographer. paul was the star of strictly ballroom and and he's come on board to teach our robots how to walk, how to move. robot school is it's an intriguing kind of um issue because yeah in school you got to learn things you know my robot school was about unlearning things. step and stop. take a character that obviously looks like a robot and take a human movement and then you know, just take that human movement and step it down once. Just take a, a, away a few subtleties. You know, less is more. Crazy. That's hilarious. <laughs> ready, ready. <laughs> That's a good robotic call there. We're trying to create a fairly elaborate world, and I've embraced new ways of doing things with digital technology. There were many scenes where literally Bridget and Will were the only real thing in the scene. If you can't remember the last time you weren't on a set that wasn't green, that'll give you a sense of the, the scope of the film. Because every time there's a robot, every time there's a stunt. That's what's going to be so crazy, is that, you know, I know what we're shooting on a day-to-day -day basis, but then actually seeing the movie with everything else added to it that I don't see on a daily basis is going to be a trip. It's definitely the most special effects work I've ever been, been involved with. And I've, I've done some big special effects movies, and uh, this one is far beyond anything that, that I've ever done.